Ah, thank you. Okay, so we are recording now. Recording. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri people um, and I pay my respect to them, all their elders past and present. I live and work on the Kulin Nation and I'd like to acknowledge the connection these people have with the land and the sea. I would like to also pay my acknowledgements to any Aboriginal people who are attending this session today. So, as I said, this event is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions during the session, just use the Q&A button um, and there will be a chance to ask questions towards the end. Um, we, you're welcome to chat and we are following the chat, but it can be hard to pick up questions. So if you have a particular question, please put it in the Q&A. I'll just remind everyone that we do have a code of conduct and we'd like to ask you to participate with interest and respect for all our users. We have four presenters here today and uh, they come from a few variety of institutions. Uh, we'd like to thank them for participating. And I might get started with our first presenter, who will be Tim Leviston from Bond University. And he's going to talk about bringing the archive to the world. Tim, over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for that. Um, welcome, everyone, to my debut uh, in the webinar space, and I hope I don't bore you too much. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay, my name's Tim Leviston. I'm uh, the Senior Library Officer here at Bond University in the Information Resources team. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick presentation um, on how we use Alma D to catalogue, um, how we store and upload images uh, and publications, as well as some memorabilia uh, that we've got in the Bond archives, um, which are now searchable via our uh, discovery layer, Primo VE, and also. Um, all the open access materials searchable via Trove and also on Google. As a bit of uh, history, uh, I'll just uh, run you through some of the, the figures. A small number, in 2005, a small number of digitised images from our uh, print image collection was made available on the library website and you can see the lovely early library newsletter there. Uh, advertising the fact. In 2007, these images were added to the new digital archive, um, which we used ePublications at Bond, which was a digital commons product, uh, which we renamed, renamed Bond Gallery. Over the years, only a few new images were added and they were done on an ad hoc basis uh, when they were needed and so forth. In 2019, the library transitioned from ePublications to Alma D and Bond Archive items on ePublications were uploaded to Alma D and a new Bond University History Collection page was added to the Primo VE collections. From April 2019, the library has had an archives project officer which has resulted in the sorting and storage of items with, to an, an archival standard, as well as items being collated and added to inventories and then digitised to Alma D. And this has enabled the staff of information resources to work off these inventories to create the metadata that enables us to put them on Alma D. As well as digitising items in the archive, the library is working with the wider Bond community 
to digitise and add other materials in the collection. And we'll cover that a bit shortly and that includes some, some memorabilia as well. So the process, I'll just cover this off uh, pretty shortly, but we're gonna go into the um, back end. I'm gonna show you some of our inventories uh, and then show you on Alma D how we create some of these records. It won't be new to some of, uh, to a lot of you, but some of you might find uh, something that we do that you don't do and vice versa. So I'll just go out and we'll have a look at our inventories. So as you can see here, I'm on our SharePoint site. Uh, this is where our digital archives, uh, our archives project officer has uh, created our inventories. And this is where, this is what we work of when we're creating our images. So you can see there, if I go into images inventory, we've got a file and this is where all our digitized images go. We've renamed them with a, a number, BG number here, and I'll go to, into that shortly. It'll become clearer why we've got that numbering system, but all our images are in there. And in the other spreadsheet, this is the actual inventory itself for the uh, all the digitized images. So our archives project officer works through the folders that are already in the archives. And you can see here we've got the number of the folder, the number of the item, and that di directly correlates to that BG number. So this image would just be BG3544 with BG standing for Bond Gallery, nothing too complicated. And you can see we go across, we've got a description uh, that the Archives Project Officer puts in. Uh, we've got subject headings. These directly relate to sub-collections, which we'll have a look at shortly, and other information about the dates, provenance, et cetera. And you can see across here, we have a digitized date. So this is the date that we actually digitized and uploaded the file to the SharePoint site. And then we've got a date where we've um, added it to Alma D. This, is in here because not every image is going to be uploaded for various reasons, whether there's duplicates, similar material, might be copyright, might be of a personal nature. So we don't upload all our images, but we do digitize all our images. So next I'm going to just show you how in Elma, how we create these records. I'm going to now show you our publications records. So we have a number of publications in the archives from the university that the university has created. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, what that looks like for us uh, in Alma. So basically in, in our metadata editor, I've created uh, templates depending on what it is we're uploading, whether it's a publication or whether it's a digital image and that way that the, the team that I work with, the information resources team, has a standard record that they work off. And I'll just show you, sorry, one. You can see here, I've got a lot of different um, templates depending on what the publication is. We're just gonna have a quick look today at achievement. So I have a standard template and this is what the team will work off. They will just change the details of that record, whether it be the year, volume number, et cetera. We put in some uh, contents fields and then in the template, I've got whatever the copyright is for that publication. So if it's open access, I've got the Creative Commons license in there. And then we have all the other information. To add a representation, we would simply hit add inventory, add representation, and then fill out what collection it gets um, added to. I'm not going to add one today. I'll just show you in the back end what that looks like. So I just search for achievement, Bond University. You can see it's added to the, this collection here, which will correspond when we have a look in Primo shortly. So in representations, we'll have a quick look. 
And this is where we put all our information in regarding that, that representation of, the, of whatever item is we've, we've digitised. You can see this is where we've got our uh, copyrights and our open access details. And you can see in files list, I showed you a publication because uh, we enhance our PDFs so that they're fully indexed and fully searchable. Uh, and that way uh, it makes it more discoverable when we're looking for them. And that would come out something like that. So all of that data there or that text is now searchable. Now we're going to have a quick look. Back to our slide. So now to the fun stuff. We're just going to have a quick look now at the collections of what we've created and, and how they display in our library search, which is our Primo VE, uh, and just how we've organised them into our gallery publications and our memorabilia. So in library search, which is our Primo, which is our discovery, we go into our collections, See here, we've got a few other different collections started. We're going to just focus on Bond University history today. And you can see here, these are our sub collections the Bond Gallery, which is our images, publications, and memorabilia. We'll have a quick look first at our digital images that we were looking at earlier. And in that spreadsheet, in those um, subject headings, this is where we get the idea of what sub collection we put it in. So we'll just have a quick look here, show you what it looks like on that end. So these are some of the images. So we'll just show you it's searchable, fully searchable within that collection. And here's a few images of early library days, plenty of good hairdos and fashion sense there. See here. That's a uh, library marketing circa 20 to oh, sorry, circa 2000. Search savvy. There you go. And here's our library manager from 1992 uh, displaying a donation. It was a collection we got off um, Joyce Aykroyd, and these were the donations. What I did want to show you is, as well as the record and how it displays, I wanted to show you how we could see how easy it is for it is now to be discovered by the world, hence the title. So in Trove, if we just have a look at that image, you can see it comes up quite clearly. You can view it, and this takes you straight back to the collection. So this is the image in our bond in Primo. You can also search straight off your internet search engine of choice. Doesn't have to be Google. And you can click on, as you can see there, because of the title, it comes up straight away. We can have a look there. And there you go, it comes straight up. It also links straight back to our collection. What I will also show you now is some of our publication, just a quick look. So running out of time. Got my public, our publications here. So these are all the different publications that we've got and you can have different settings on that. Bond Brief is only viewable if I'm logged in because that's only available to staff and students. But we'll have a quick look at our achievement to stick with the theme. Plus, it was our very first uh, publication here at the university. It's this one here. This is our very first publication, which has now made this since being digitised available to a wide audience. And see there, this was the university. 
uh, before it was even physically here on this land, construction and side tools at Guinea. And that's how our metadata displays. And we also have our library staff view turned on so that everyone can see our mark fields. Okay, and now one last look at our collection again. And just recently, we got approached by uh, Bond Sport uh, to house some of their collections. They were interested in what they could do with uh, their memorabilia. So they've uh, given it to the library to archive and put in the archives as a physical uh, collection. But we've also been able to take photos of that and show them what we could do with their memorabilia. So we've taken a photo, created our records, and this has enabled them to see uh, all their, their things. And obviously this isn't limited to Bond Sport. We have a lot of other stuff that we are going to hope to digitise in the future. And you can see, again, get all of our metadata there. So that's all I've got to show you today. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions or we'll wait for the end, but uh, thank you all for listening and feel free to contact me if you've got any questions about uh, anything I've shown you today. So thank you very much. There's no questions in the Q&A at the moment, um, but if anyone has any, please add them in the Q&A and we may have time to visit them at the end with Tim. Yes, thank you for that, Tim. That was great. Uh, we're now going to go to Rachel Trapia and Amelia Rowe from RMIT University, who will be talking about capacity building for collaboration, self-service and RMIT course guides in digital archiving and access project. So are you okay for me to share? Okay, so yep. do you have a present? If you yep, do, I'm I just going to share my screen. Uh, I want to share this screen. So I hope people can see it. Oh no, I've got to click the share button. There we go. Just checking that people can see my screen. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Obviously we are from uh, RMIT. Um, a little bit of the background. Um, my role is manager discovery systems and facilities. An interesting fact about me is that I play American football and my favorite position to play is linebacker because you get to tackle people. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Trapia. I'm the senior coordinator at uh, RMIT University Archives. And, um, well, interesting fact, or maybe weird, um, I went swimming for the first time in the Yarra on the weekend at the um, Deep Rock Swimming Hole. Um, yeah, and I highly recommend it. <laughs> um just a little quick, you know, skip through the uh, session outline slide, but we do have a Slido poll coming up. So if you hop into the chat channel, you will see a link to a Slido poll. Um, and while you're bringing up your Slido poll, um, the institution we're at, RMIT, we have a number of physical sites. And at the moment, we have roughly 60,000 full-time equivalent students. And here's the question for your Slido poll. So I hope people are in there and answering the question already. But the question is, what digital material, either digitized or born digital, are you currently struggling to find a home for? So I hope people are jumping in, adding a few answers, single word or multiple words. 
You're not seeing the link in chat. Maybe I, oh, I only sent it to hosts and panelists. That would be why. Okay, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it should be there now. <laughs> All right. So we'll give people a little bit of time to answer some, some pop some question answers in there and I will drag the answers over in a minute. Hmm. And they are increasing with the number of answers people are giving. Let me see if I can drag this screen over to see what people are talking about. Let's make that a bit bigger. There we go. It gives us a nice pretty word cloud. Scholarship of teaching and research, sound recordings, AV. So there's a few different material types. Others might still be adding their answers. Um, so what we're talking about today, I think Rachel will get into the type of resource we found to work with. Thanks, Amelia. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to talk about a digital archiving project that we did, uh, we collaborated on um, across the collections unit in uh, the library uh, to do with RMIT University course guides um, from 1999 to 2005. Um, so we're talking about approximately 183,000 items. Um, and the course guides, um, uh, digital course guides, are dated from 99 to 2005, mostly from higher education and some vocational education or TAFE course guides. Um, they, uh, the course guides or subject guides, um, as they're also known, were produced by the various faculties and departments or schools of RMIT Uni and were publicly accessible from the RMIT University website. Uh, they're important for several reasons. Currently, they're being used by alumni uh, and also um, various departments uh, around the uni. Um, alumni applying for further study, uh, and that's where a lot of our requests are coming from right now. Uh, but more generally, they document in part the legacy and history of RMIT University, so that's why we really want to preserve them. Um, and why we chose the course guides uh, as opposed to many, many other um, digital um, objects we could preserve is because we use them a lot um, and uh, our users use them a lot as well. So we were hoping that we would save staff time and increase user self-service. Um, we wanted to ensure that these important born digital assets were preserved and accessible over time. And uh, we, wanted, we wanted to minimise the proliferation of legacy media types and storage systems used for preservation. Um, and on that topic, um, we had to decide which file formats we were going to keep. Um, so the, the um, course guides were originally um, in a content management system called Remix, and they were from that they were published to the web. So all the different schools used to put their information in there. Um, and as a result, when it was decommissioned, we got several formats, in, including CDs and um, from the Remix database, plus HTML and also PDF. So we thought, what are we going to preserve? And we decided to um, go with the PDFs because the HTML pages hadn't been captured by a web archiving tool. So they were just static HTML pages and the dynamic aspects did not function. They'd been also stripped of all their styling. Um, so in the end, it was the content of the course guides that became our focus and what we wanted to preserve since the materiality of the original, unfortunately, was lost in that very short time. You know, we're just talking from 2005 to now, we, you know, it's amazing how quickly digital stuff can be lost. Um, so the a bit of the history in the timeline, the original Remix course guidelines, as a, uh, guides, as I said, were archived um, by ITS onto CDs when it was decommissioned. And um, the CDs were then transferred to RMIT archives and our, um, our accession notes, it was before my time, but um, they sort of record the various issues that um, archivists were having to in trying to access the course guides 
um, on, on the CDs. So again, media already having trouble in this really short time. Um, in 2011, um, ITS extracted the HTML files and created PDFs of those um, HTML pages and saved them on a university shared drive. So that's basically all we have left. Um, and they supplied archives with an index to all the guides in the form of an access database. So fast forward to 2021 in July, a core team started meeting and emailing about a project to preserve the guides. Um, so a lot of the work was in the preparation as we'll probably be um, driving that point home a few times during this talk. Um, we had to first confirm um, access rights with all the various departments and schools across the university because we wanted them to be publicly available. Um, also, we um, needed um, to give um, Amelia actually and her team some sample PDF files to explore what the best ingest options were going to be. Um, then um, we had to um, extract some of the metadata from the access database into a CSV file. And um, we also did a data mapping exercise. So we chose Dublin Core as our metadata schema and um, uh, mapped the Dublin Core for Rosetta. So this was just some of the preparation that, that happened. Um, and there were some really chunky emails <laughs> that, <laughs> that went around. Um, so the, the ingest work, which is probably the most resource intensive work because it involved the most people, happened from September to December in 2021. So we had a team of six, took a pretty agile project management approach with you know weekly meetings, it was very task oriented, um, uh, uh, very incremental. Um, and we gave a lot of attention to record keeping, documentation, really good documentation and comms between the teams to keep things flowing. Um, and Amelia is gonna go into more detail about the uh, sort of technical side shortly, but broadly the steps were preparing the data for ingest within the CSV files. So this, this is what this team had to do. And then um, once that was all um, done, we commenced the test loads and we started uh, with 100. And then we, when that worked, we moved to 1,000 and so on. Um, and then after that came the production loads and then the last phase involved publication in our public facing library search. Um, how am I going for time, Amelia? Can we move on? <laughs> next oh, step. So yeah, so I've popped in a link for the next Slido poll. Uh, so just asking you, what options have you considered or are you using to host digital objects? We know there are a lot of, a lot of different systems, a lot of different options out there. So what are you doing? using or what are you maybe considering using? And I will see if I can view results in a nice clear way. Alma D is looking quite big. So lots of you are either using or looking at Alma D. Rosetta is not too far behind with a few photo wear. I don't think I've heard of that one. I'm gonna have to go look that one up. And in-house repositories as well. So a bit of Make your own. Yeah, so we, we had a few options that we did look at. Um, we're not going to talk in too much detail about them. Um, we did end up going with Rosetta. Some of the main things that pushed us to Rosetta, obviously it's designed with digital preservation in mind. So that was a big selling point. And the other real strong point for it was its ability to handle bulk imports. Um, but I would say it did take probably a bit more staff training. It's maybe not as user friendly as something like Alma. It's a bit more technical. Um, we did consider Alma Digital. Um, I think it's not quite designed with the same digital preservation in mind as Rosetta. And for bulk imports, it can be very, very slow. So Rosetta does, I think, personally, my personal opinion, Rosetta handles really, really big loads much better. Um, Rachel, did you want to talk on our content manager? Oh, uh, yeah, just quickly to say that, yeah, that's our, our the university's electronic records management system. So everyone's familiar with it and it could work, could have worked in the short term. But again, just repeating what uh, Amelia is saying, it's not a digital preservation system. 
can't ensure that the information it contains is going to remain accessible to users from now and you know into the future we don't know how long um, and um, it doesn't do file integrity checks can't deal with format obsolescence or bit rot so we really needed that digital preservation underpinning because these are permanent records yeah um, so obviously what we chose to go with was putting the records into Rosetta with an OA harvest, OAI harvest into Alma Digital as remote representations in order to enable display in library search, which is collection discovery in Primo VE. Now I'm going to start off saying what our solution was, was um, there are a few reasons we went for this. But this is not the only way to work with Rosetta. So if you're watching this presentation, trying to get an idea of Rosetta, this is not the only way to work with it. It has a lot of options with how you set up your workflows and you could do it very differently to this. Um, so obviously the main reason for choosing Rosetta was its digital preservation capabilities, its ability to run reports, to check file um, sizes for for uh, changes, bit rot. Um, it even managed to pick up, well, when we were loading them, it picked up a file that had a zero file size and went, this is a problem. It gave a system error saying, this is a problem. And we were able to instantly go and find an older version of that PDF and replace it. Um, so that was the kind of thing that Rosetta was able to do for us. We ended up doing it as remote representations into Alma simply because collection discovery in Primo and we really wanted these records to be discoverable by, discoverable by the end user because that's where the self-service model comes in, in that um, our alumni can go into library search and find these themselves without having to ask us for them. But because we already had a lot of digital resources coming from Alma Digital into Primo for collection discovery, we had to continue using that because the collection discovery functionality only works with one system. So it was either you point your collection discovery for Primo VE at Alma Digital or you point it at Rosetta. And since we already had other resources coming from Alma Digital, we had to funnel our Rosetta records through Alma Digital. Um, so it just adds an extra step, but I've kind of broken this workflow up into a few different colors and levels. So that first level there is all the work the preparation work before you even start touching Rosetta. So getting the files into the right location. So our Rosetta instance can only read from, I think it's two or three files on our network drive. So RMIT being very risk averse, Rosetta can't read from everything. It's got a very narrow scope. So we had to copy those files from the archives folder in the network, uh, which it was on into the new one, which is where we got that zero KB file coming about because copying files can cause problems. We had to convert that metadata that Rachel mentioned that we got from the Remix database. So we had did have some existing metadata uh, from that original system. Things like course names, uh, sometimes descriptions. Uh, we had to convert that into a CSV format that uh, Rosetta would be happy with um, and then save that into the correct folder location for Rosetta to read from um, and then overnight Rosetta could actually grab whatever files had been created and popped in there um, bring that into the system now the next step is actually one you could do away with if you wanted to we chose to keep it um, and that was to do a quality check of the ingest so Rosetta lets you choose how much material, so it could be all of it, it could be 50% of it, it could be none of it, goes into what they call an assessor's workbench. And for us, this we wanted to go into it because the assessor's workbench is basically a last chance to check it before it goes into preservation. And we really wanted it there because this is permanent material, stuff that we want to keep forever or forever in our minds. <laughs> um, and we didn't want to have to correct it in the future. So we wanted to get it right the first time. So we added, added the extra step that everything will get stopped at the assessor's workbench. And we had, what was it, over 183,000 files. 
So we didn't actually manually check every item. We just did a quick spot check of every, you know, three or four of every thousand. So we broke our file loads up uh, just for the sake of troubleshooting and for the sake of these spot checks. And once they passed their spot checks, they were allowed into preservation. And then we created just a publishing profile via OAI to go into Alma and creating, or it goes to the OAI. And then Alma was able to harvest from the OAI to create the remote representations, which then actually quite easily flow into Primo VE very, very quickly. And this is when I grab another screen to bring over because talking about it is one thing, but showing is far nicer. So this is our collection discovery page. And at the moment, our course guides are at the bottom, but maybe in the future, we should bring them up a bit to make them a bit more discoverable. Um, I think the only thing I would love to change about the collection discovery is that the description doesn't support spacing. We would love to have a few line breaks in this description because there's actually a section here we've called search tips where we're trying to give the user some tips about how to find their course guide. So search for uh, your course code. And then they can just go from the course code, they can select which year and semester they were after and click through to it. They can have a look at the actual PDF that's delivered, confirm if that's the one they want. And if it is, they can click the, click the download button. And in less than a minute, they've done what used to take multiple emails back and forth with the archives team. So what the user can now do for themselves in a minute has saved quite a lot of time, I think, for our archives team. Uh, oh, let's go. Oh, let's go back one or two. Um, obviously, a project like this is not without its challenges. So I'll talk just a, a couple of these. Um, one of the challenges was that a lot of our staff are unfamiliar with Rosetta. Um, we only had a couple of staff initially trained up in Rosetta when we went live with it a number of years ago, and our archive staff weren't even in the library at that point. Um, so there was quite a bit of a lot of training uh, needed for those staff before they were comfortable working uh, with Rosetta and so that they understood what we were doing with Rosetta. Uh, the technical setup, we had to create a whole new workflow in Rosetta to accommodate the new resources that we were bringing in. And since we went live with Rosetta, we've only ever used the two workflows that um, Ex Libris created for us. So it was a bit of a learning curve to, oh, how do we create a new workflow? We know we can do it, but we've never actually done it before. So there was a bit of uh, another learning point there. Um, and the other challenge was actually getting the CSV files correct. Um, Rosetta could be really, really finicky if there was something wrong in the CSV file, um, incorrect, um, capitalization in a header row or an interesting one we found was a non-breaking space in the header and if you had something wrong in the header all the data in that column would be missed or is that it just wouldn't read it um, so we actually found ourselves doing a lot of troubleshooting just on errors in csv files which is why we put so much emphasis on staff training and how to create the CSV files correctly and also where that QA step proved really, really valuable because Rosetta didn't necessarily flag missing metadata as a problem unless it was on a key field like a title or a file path field. Um, if it was like something like a subject field or a description missing, it wouldn't have picked it up, but our QA testing did pick it up. Uh, Rachel, did you want to talk on some of the other challenges? Uh, no, I think you've done it. I think you've pretty much covered it, I reckon. Yeah. It's, yeah. Great summary. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> and lessons learned. Yeah. Give yourself sure. lots of preparation time. <laughs> These are sort of like things that can happen with every any project, really. But it's just 
it's always like the thing you think you're going to spend most of the time on is never, you know, there's stuff before and after that just, yeah, you need to really allow for. Most of the project was in the pre-ingest phase before the files were loaded. Um, and another um, thing I really love um, to think of um, is a, it's a phrase invented by Tim Gollins. It's called parsimonious preservation. Um, so it's just, I always had that at the back of my mind. Get what you can done with the resources you have. We aspire to the gold standard. It's always there in our vision and there are fundamentals we won't sacrifice, but we might have to kind of go bronze in the meantime, given the people and the time and the infrastructure. We've got, we've got to be pragmatic. We need to, um, you know, achieve safe and secure storage of the course guides, and, and um, which, which is what we uh, did. So, yeah. That was a new term I learned doing this presentation with you. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the other big thing for us was making sure we assigned the staff resources to actually do the work. I think everyone has a day job and we did even find during our um, ingest phase with the CSV file creation that there were some staff that were so busy with their other work that they actually couldn't do the workload that was assigned to them for um, the CSV file creation and we did need to ask other staff to pick it up. Um, so yeah, just make sure if you're doing a big project like this, that you do go, this staff member is working on this project and you ask them to assign the time accordingly and you free up their time if you're their manager. Yeah. And it doesn't stop there. There's always more to do. <laughs> always, yeah, there's always more. And yeah, so next we're looking at another, uh, another project um, for the digital theses and student records pilot, we're calling it. So yeah, just similar, similar call, sort of, um, it will be similar um, project to what we did with the course guides. Um, and um, also um, we've got to look at, um, through this pilot, we're hoping to look at um, some of, um, you know, investigate access restrictions, for example, um, other preservation issues such as storage at multiple geographic locations, like those sort of important digital preservation infrastructure uh, questions, as well as, yeah, how do we, how do we kind of, yeah, use Rosetta for um, different levels of access, um, uh, especially when we're dealing with something sensitive like student records. Yeah, so thank you. Yep. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Rachel and Amelia. That was very interesting, um, particularly since I will be working on a project with you, Rachel, other Rachels, soon on this very same topic. Yeah, the two Rachels. Yes, it's a very Rachel-y project. Uh, our next presenter is Margaret Warren from the State Library of Queensland. And she will be talking about the State Library's Corporate Image Library. Margaret, are you good to go? Yes, I am good to go. I'm just getting my screen sharing up. Or are you doing that for me? Uh, no, if you could do the screen sharing. Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, hi, my name's Margaret Warren. I'm um, the Director of Digital Delivery at State Library of Queensland, and I'm giving this presentation on behalf of the teams that worked on our Corporate Image Library project. Um, and so I'll just, uh, for those who don't know, uh, we're, uh, um, we're based in, in Brisbane, but we service the whole of the state. Um, our corporate image library, um, or our corporate images before we start calling it the corporate image library, um, what we did is we were in a situation where we realised we had a problem and I just wanted to briefly go through what the problem was. Um, we had lots of corporate images, so those are images that don't belong in the collection. Um, or had not yet been selected as things that potentially might go into the collection. They lived all over our shared drive. Um, we had a procedure for staff to select which images say from an event. So our corporate images might be things that we use in our website, images that are taken at an event, um, exhibition openings, um, uh, all sorts of uh, public 
kinds of events, things that we took for promotional purposes. So things that didn't belong in the collection. They lived on our shared drive. They were incredibly difficult to find. Um, they were uh, accessible to people who knew where they were and what they were. But we had really poor connections also between those images and any permissions or rights that were attached to those images. Um, if there were images of um, children or young people under the age of 18, there was no clear linkages to the consent um, uh, forms that had been signed by their parents or guardians. And so there was this sort of huge mess, basically, a, a knotty, messy problem of um, images that was incredibly time consuming for staff who wanted to use them for um, a whole range of purposes, everything from a presentation at a conference to our annual highlights report to um, annual reporting to staff presentations to conference presentations. And we ended up, it actually ended up um, also having multiple copies of images. So uh, a proof sheet of an event that might have been taken had say 15 images stored on a shared drive and uh, no one had done the hard work of determining, well, actually we only need to keep three of those images. So there was this, you know, big, messy, knotty problem. And the problem was really about, we wanted to, um, for our staff to be able to quickly search and discover and um, look at, um, make sure that they've got the access to use images for a, a range of corporate purposes. Um, so our, our current world was not good um, and we wanted to move to something better. Um, we're also one of the other drivers was um, the organisation's move to um, MS365 and the need to clean up and archive much of the content on the, the, the current um, shared drive that we were doing. So there were lots of potential things that we could um, think about doing, but what we decided was to use um, Primo as uh, the discovery uh, layer for this content and to use um, Alma D as the place where the metadata would live and be stored. Um, when I say we're using Primo, we are, we've um, set up a separate view for our corporate image library that requires um, login. So, because obviously some of these images are not um, ones that are mean, meant to be seen by the public. So I'm just going to log myself on so that, um, so, that uh, so that I can actually then get in and, and use it. So what we did was to um, set that up. But one of the other problems that we had with our time is our staff in our um, cataloging metadata services area was certainly not, didn't have the adequate resourcing to be able to describe effectively and set in place a whole new um, set of workflows for getting this content, um, these corporate images into Alma. And so one of the things that we made as a non-negotiable was that the staff who were responsible for the acquisition of these corporate images, so let's say we were doing a project um, that was related to our first five forever uh, program for early literacy work with children up to the age of five. And so if someone from that team was um, purchasing or commissioning some images to be used for promotional purposes, that team would be responsible for ensuring that content was selected and then uh, described and put into the corporate image library so that it was very hands off from the point of view of our metadata services team and the team that managed the, the discovery layer, the front end. And so there was a lot of preparation work that thought, well, how will we make this work? Um, and we took, chose two pathways. One was to, um, one was to, for a single upload. So if there were individual images for the staff wanted to upload, or if there were multiple images from the same um, event. We also wanted to make the front page of the corporate image library a one-stop shop. So if you look along the top menu, we've got the search. Um, we wanted to have links to the default deposit form um, for a single item and then a place to use a spreadsheet, uh, which then made into a CSV for a bulk upload into Alma. Our troubleshooting tips, um, which is a detailed sort of help guide 
um, search help as well, and an overview of the corporate image library, which talks about what's meant to be in there and uh, what's what's not meant to be in there. So, and, and obviously because it was important that uh, staff had to log in to search, that's sitting right there on the front of the homepage. Um, so what we did then was to um, work with the very clever people in our metadata services and D DLI team. I'm just gonna show you the deposit form for a single image because this really explains some of the outcomes that we wanted to get out of it. So they just go in here, I'm looking forward to the single sign-on days, but we're not quite there yet. Doing its thing. Okay, so here I'm going to create a deposit into our corporate image library. And so the, the, um, the staff member who's going to upload this is um, presented with this online form that allows them to go through, and, and obviously the asterisk items are the ones that are required fields. So the State Library news, username is there. It's really helpful because then we can track if there are any problems and also, you know, sort of um, look at what's there. They select which branch they're from, and these, this can be um, uh, changed to put the, the date, um, and that's the date the photo was taken. So they sort of enter the date the image was made in the day, day, month, year format. And you'd be surprised at how many people don't read the screen and put it in other formats. A title of the image, and then some description. So in the description field, that they can describe it um, in as little or as much detail. When we did our training with the, with the teams, we said, you need to imagine that you or somebody that doesn't know this image is there um, is trying to find this image and, and try and make your description as helpful as possible. Um, and then we <clears throat> included uh, a list for the name of the photographer. Um, so there's, there's plenty there and there's others if it's not um, some of our identified um, staff photographers. The name of the event that's being photographed, if it was an event, the sort of type of event it was. So was it a class, a workshop, a conference, a symposium, a festival, fundraising, launch, talk, lecture, the main sorts of events that we have. If it was at State Library, what venue it was it in? So that includes um, our Anzac Square Memorial Galleries, the Asia Pacific Design Library, the corner is our children's area. Um, names of people if known, um, so uh, if there were people in the image to identify who they were. Um, there's a demographics one, which was really to look at the sorts of um, audiences or sometimes the things that we want to be able to, when we're searching, oh, we just want photos of our donors. We just want photos of people, um, First Nations families or things like that. Um, consent and release information, that's where people note the records file where the consent information has gone. Um, is it an image, a video, or is it some other uh, format? And the option there to put the, uh, the file format, which we ask um, the staff to do. So whether it's, uh, you know, an AVI or a GIF or a J JP2, JPEG, they're the ones that we can accept. Um, whoops any additional notes, then people select the file and upload it at the highest resolution they have. Say so they've checked the terms and conditions, which really say, um, when I've said about the consent information and the rights information about this, that I'm, I'm not telling porky pies, and, uh, and then they submit it. I'm not gonna submit this one. So all of that work is done by the individual um, who is, who's doing it. It then gets um, sent into Alma, and then um, the next day when the, the, pipe, the pipe is run into Primo, that image will appear. So for us, uh, and then if there is um, bulk images, there's a spreadsheet that's used and then that gets um, uploaded to um, Alma as well. I'm just gonna go back to the homepage and take you through a couple. So the problems that we were trying to solve were multitudinous, um, but now we can actually have a place where people can search um, images in our corporate image library. I'm just going to search for um, Anzac. Um, that cannot possibly be right. Oh, sorry, I logged out. My, my deep apologies, hang on. Now I'm in. Let's search for Anzac. So 
So we can see here there's um, 110 results um, related to ANZAC. Um, and it's particularly um, photos to do with ANZAC Square. What, uh, so the, the images are there for a person to select. They get all of the options that we have in the, the front end of Primo, being able to save records that they like and um, check and see what they're like. And, and quite a lot of post-search refi post refining um, if people are, you know, so they have a broad topic and then they want to go down and use um, use some post-search refining for particular events. Um, you can also search, uh, basically I'm looking for a JPEG, I'm looking for JPEGs um, and also, uh, you know, sort of things like uh, if we want to particularly look for, um, you know, photos that were taken by Life, for example, who's one of our staff photographers. So it gives us that opportunity and then we go and have a look, uh, then we can just go and that takes us into the Alma D uh, into the full record and then into Alma D to look at it. And at this point, then um, we can, it's there um, and say, yep, that's the one that I want to use for my presentation um, for, for Brisbane City Council to show how fantastic it is to have students in the Anzac Square galleries. Um, and then uh, you can uh, download download that image from that point. And you have all of the information in the metadata that you need to attribute it correctly where you're using it to confirm that the permissions have been gained to use that content and then to go ahead and use it. One of the other really neat features that we wanted to um, have uh, was to provide the opportunity for staff when they use an image um, so we've got some things here. If they've used an image, like I used this in the annual report 2019, um, and that will then get added to the notes um, notes afterwards. It was used in, uh, uh, I don't know, the State Librarian's um, annual fundraising speech. So we can see if there are images that are getting overuse or underuse. You can also put in additional documentation. So let's say there was um, a, a, a change in the consent and release information, and one of those uh, one of those children uh, who only appears in that photo, um, their consent was withdrawn. Then that could be added. And lastly, we can you can report uh, an error which just goes to our cataloging mailbox. So our catalogers are responsible for any sort of updates that might need to be you know, if an error is found. And I did actually find an error the other day that uh, when I was uh, searching for this um, of uh, Remembrance Day, when I was looking for, well, I can't even spell Remembrance, but luckily it found it. When I was looking in the people um, in the Remembrance Day um, photos, I saw that we had two spellings for, and I can't see it here, but in this record, there was more than one spelling of uh, Dr. Jeanette Young, who was our, um, our chief health officer and then became uh, then became governor. So it's really useful if you need photos of the premier, which we sometimes do need. Um, and so then you can have a look and see that in this um, in this we've got um, in this Remembrance Day thing we've got ten photos of the premier and which one of those might we want to use um, for a presentation on the day when the premier is coming to the library. And we think, oh, she's smiling in this photo. Let's use that one. So it's really helpful um, for, for teams right across the library to bring together um, all of our corporate images. The biggest lesson that we've learned from this is that um, for staff who work in marketing and communications and in, uh, in exhibitions and, and other staff may not have had much experience um, in describing content and also no experience in the Alma world. But by using the online form, it made it easier for them just to put in the information that we required so that we could then create meaningful records to allow, enable us to use this resource. And then the second, uh, the second challenge, which I think doesn't really matter what the outcome, what the, um, the front end or the process is, is to remind staff to uh, to actually do this work and not to leave it um, as soon as the, the event is over to move on to something else and leave it on some external drive or USB. But um, generally speaking, there's been a, a great deal of positive um, response to this because it's so much easier and so much more efficient to find content to use for our corporate image library collections. 
um, and it also enables us to use the most current, um, the current information. Our selection um, team for adding content to the collection um, can also look through um, the corporate image library, say once every six months and make determinations about any um, images that they think should then move into the collection as the permanent, um, the permanent sort of record of the life of the library over time, as well as the life of Queenslanders. And when that happens, they, they'll get ingested into Rosetta so that um, those preservation actions will be run on them. And I've gone fairly rapidly, but I hope that's been really helpful and happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Margaret, that was fantastic, really interesting. Our final speaker for today is Daniel Greenberg from Ex Libris, and he will be talking about Alma Digital controlled exposure of collections. Thank you for joining us, Daniel, and thank you for joining us at a time that's probably not that great for you. Sure, no problem. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting me here, and it was great to hear also the uh, the feedback also in the, on the previous sessions. Um, I will share my screen. And let me know if you can't hear me properly because I did actually have a previous meeting before, even before this one and uh, I had some sort of connectivity issues. Um, so let me know um, if it repeats itself and I'll just turn off the video or something. Um, so I'll talk about, um, so, so for those of you who are maybe less familiar with Alma Digital, I'll do just two slides, very briefly, a, a, an overview of what uh, Alma Digital is, even though you've heard some examples today. Um, uh, and then I'll basically today, I'm gonna focus on sort of the balance uh, between exposing, providing sort of optimal exposure to your library collections uh, while maintaining a controlled access um, to the uh, actual content. Um, in the context of copyright management. Um, I'll talk about controlled digital lending, um, which is an epic, uh, which uh, um, has, has already started to be uh, delivered and we're gonna be continuing working on it um, in the upcoming, uh, um, well, basically years. Um, so first of all, what is Alma Digital? Um, so um, Alma um, as a system um, um, allows incorporating, uh, having a unified uh, management system for all the types of content that, uh, um, that most uh, libraries around the world uh, hold, um, which would be physical, um, some electronic, and, uh, and many today um, um, digital. Uh, libraries, as you know, are becoming more and more um, digital, uh, needing to provide, uh, both from the, for the need to provide remote access, um, which, is, uh, which has become a, a stronger need also following the pandemic, um, but also um, the need to have some sort of digital uh, uh, backup, either for preservation um, or for remote access. Um, and, uh, um, and of course, you know, born digital material, uh, which is becoming a more common practice. Um, you know, electronic theses and dissertations are becoming more common. Um, and also the end user, uh, the patron expectations um, is, uh, is becoming more digital centric. Um, so traditionally institutions, they, they usually have separate systems for the different types of, uh, of uh, content, uh, really for the main reason that uh, different types of content that require different services, different uh, uh, treatment. Um, of course, digital content images and so on, it requires completely different services um, on the fire level um, than the actual items, the physical items or electronic records. Um, and just, um, just to remind that the difference between electronic and digital is that digital is under the ownership um, of the institution, not the copyrights, but the actual copy. Um, and uh, while electronic does not belong uh, to, the, uh, um, to the library, uh, they just purchase a, a, um, a subscription and so on, but the actual files are owned by, a, uh, ex by an external vendor. Um, so while it is true that the files themselves, they do require um, specific and specialized services, um, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the metadata services and the interoperability with other systems is similar and is agnostic for the type of content. Um, and therefore here, Alma um, provides a unified management system. So um, it's a combination of a system which provides an abstraction, in other words, services uh, mainly on the title level um, and up, 
um, and uh, uh, which is common for all the different types of content, um, together with combined with specific services for digital records and, and a full digital asset management system. Um, so uh, Alma Digital is agnostic to the type of formats which are deposited into the system. Um, um, but on the other hand, does provide a rich set of services for each one of these uh, uh, types of formats of files, um, which I'll talk about. Um, and that allows different libraries to use it for different needs. Um, so, and we can see it, so it's, it's very, uh, today Alma Digital is, is used by uh, close to 700 um, uh, Alma um, libraries, Alma institutions. Um, and um, with a very, very diverse use um, of Alma Digital. So some use it for ETDs, for electronic thesis dissertations. Others um, have digitized journals, books, and so on, which are uploaded into the system. Um, we have it also for uh, being used for legal deposits. Um, and we have it also uh, used by museums and galleries. We'll talk about uh, also the roadmap plans for around that. Um, and you saw the collection discovery in, in Primo, um, which allows sort of exposing uh, and is fully customizable for that purpose. Um, and we have also others using it for learning materials um, and, and many more uses. So um, I'll, I'll first talk a bit, um, a bit about the exposing your special collections, um, and then um, we'll talk about how that uh, can be controlled. Um, so first of all, there, is, uh, there are uh, ma three main um, delivery services which are provided out of the box in Alma. Um, and uh, there is also a, uh, there's a rich set of APIs similar to other functionality in, in Alma, which allows also there's delivery APIs, which allows institutions to um, integrate their remote uh, viewer. Uh, it's not very commonly used, mainly because uh, really the, the out of box ones cover almost all the, um, the, the formats which are commonly used today by, by libraries. Um, however, that option does exist, and there's also blogs explaining how an external viewer can be incorporated. Um, and then there's a set, so once you have the, uh, the three um, out-of-the-box viewers enabled, um, you can create a set of rules in the system which defines when each one of those viewers will be uh, used. So for the end user, this will be, of course, automatic. Um, in other words, if it's, for example, um, as you can see here, if it's a high, you can define a rule that if it's a high-resolution image, a TIFF or JPEG 2000, um, it will automatically be rendered by uh, the universal viewer, um, which is a, a third party open source viewer based on the IIIF framework, uh, which is currently being upgraded um, to, the, um, to the latest IIIF version three, which will, will also allow um, rendering uh, non-image sequences such as audio visual and PDF. But this is really this, the, the, uh, the, 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 special, the, the, the view itself and the framework of IIIF specializes um, in rendering a high resolution images in a timely manner. Um, it creates some sort of low resolution cache, a sort of derivative copy, um, uh, which is uh, provided to the end user quickly. And then you can zoom in for high resolution segments um, of the image. Um, otherwise, um, uh, you can define a rule that if it's a digitized book, and if the entity type is a, the material type is a book, then it will be rendered using the Internet Archive Book Reader. Again, these are just examples of rules that can be created. Um, and uh, the Internet Archive Book Reader is also based on the IIIF framework. So it renders um, books which are digitized as um, image formats, such as TIFF, JPEG, and so on, and provides a sort of book reading experience. Um, a nice feature in the book reader is that it, uh, you can actually search for full text, um, OCR full text in the uh, actual viewer, um, and it will highlight the, uh, the results um, inside the image itself, um, since uh, it, has a, um, it knows how to read um, an Alto XML file, OCR file. Um, and then there's the native uh, Alma viewer, which is most commonly used one, I guess. Um, and it's written all in one. So it's based, first of all, on the, the browser capabilities for rendering files. So it can render uh, PDFs, um, image files, audio visual, um, also streaming uh, formats such as HLS. Um, but also we've uh, embedded the OpenC Dragon Viewer, which is based on the IIIF. So you can also render high resolution images such as um, JPEG uh, 2000 um, and TIFF. Um, and um, uh, and any file which is not supported by HTML5 um, will be offered then for download. 
So uh, the th this viewer was developed uh, approximately two years ago. Um, it was sort of a next gen of the previous uh, older viewer, um, and it, it's based on the Angular environment, and uh, it, it therefore can be uh, fully customized um, with a Primo VE package. So you don't have to have Primo VE for customizing it, but um, it's on the Primo VE infrastructure. So you can customize it using Primo Studio, um, apply your own um, flavor. Uh, you can remove different elements from the screen, for example, uh, sharing or, or, or any other element which you don't have on the screen, even though most of those are also um, configurable back in the system, in the back in the ALMA backend. Um, and uh, many other features which are um, um, which are which are available uh, due to the fact that this is a native viewer. We developed it, and therefore there's a lot of capabilities for uh, customizing it. Um, and like the third parties, which uh, are, are slightly more limited from the customization point of view. Um, so as I said, um, a lot of custom, uh, a lot of content specific uh, uh, features. Uh, which allow you to use it in an advanced way for each uh, for for different uses. So for textual files, just as an example, we have um, a, an OCR service inside the system. So we have Alma um, running um, a, a a file level job for extracting full text from the files, um, and uh, um, this is based on on Tikar Tesseract. It works on uh, both textual files such as PDF um, and image files such as JPEG and so on. Um, so the full text is extracted. It can be displayed side by side um, with the actual uh, files. Also in the Alma viewer, we added sort of on the um, right-hand uh, pane, you can actually see the full text. You can search for it. So it's, of course, important for accessibility. Um, and also the full text um, can, is then viewable and searchable um, in Primo VE. So it's automatically indexed in Primo VE, um, and you can search it there. Um, and you can also manage it in, in Alma, so you can actually download the full text, correct it, and then upload the corrected version. Um, and we also have the PDF.js uh, viewer for, for um, a sort of optimal experience for viewing PDFs um, and other functionality around textual uh, um, uh, content. For images, we have, as I mentioned, we have um, the IIIF framework, all the different layers of a IIIF framework, which means also the um, the actual image server, the canvas, um, and, and but also the uh, we have APIs for directly accessing the manifest, the IIIF manifest, and then also the viewers themselves, um, Universal Viewer, OpenSea Dragon, and the um, Internet Archive Book Reader. Um, I'll talk about watermarks soon, but this is relates to uh, copyrights. Um, and then audio video, uh, we have a media conversion job uh, which takes formats, the um, audio video formats, which are not supported by HTML5 and converts them over to MP4 or HLS, which is a streaming format. Um, and then uh, we allow streaming those via VideoJS video um, in the uh, um, actual viewer. And very soon um, in an uh, upcoming release, we're going to support also uh, closed caption subtitles um, for video files. Um, so then sort of like um, taking more bird's eye view coming from uh, Primo, then uh, we have also the quick access, which allows just in one click um, to access the full record in Primo and already play um, or view or, or, or download the actual file without having to then um, have an additional click into the actual uh, uh, viewer. Um, so uh, we saw some nice examples today. So uh, yeah, um, so there's really no need to talk about the collection lobby, but it's, it's customizable. You can define uh, which thumbnails appear here. You can, of course, define the different default sort routines. Um, so um, uh, very much end user um, oriented um, and a lot of uh, functionality which can be customized in the back end. So as I said, very soon uh, um, in uh, uh, June, July, we're going to have closed caption subtitles for video files. Um, and we're starting on working a very big project with Pre together with Primo um, uh, for exhibition view. So this is basically being an alternative display of the collection lobby, um, more oriented towards um, narratives, uh, telling a sort of historical timeline um, according to uh, um, um, either a historic timeline or just simply telling a, a, a story um, um, or describing an exhibition, for example. Um, so these are just some of the use cases. Um, and I guess I'll use the opportunity as a reach out for those of you who would like to um, sort of uh, be development partners and, and uh, um, or at least participate and provide use cases and uh, uh, help us with um, focusing the design. Uh, it's going to be fully customizable, so you'd be able to really 
Um, and the idea here is to have some sort of narrative where you have images um, and uh, together with description um, uh, and uh, um, uh, followed by um, all the titles under a specific collection, which will be displayed as a, as a, a sort of special um, exhibition. So uh, that was uh, uh, that was very briefly the um, uh, some of the uh, um, uh, some of the functionality which we provide around exposing the special collections. Um, I'm not sure if I'll have any time to show anything today. I think not. Um, so I'll continue talking about um, copyright management, um, a bit specifically about controlled digital lending, which is uh, um, which is a hot topic uh, recently, um, but not only. So. Uh, first of all, generally, um, 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 Alma has, al has always provided a rich set of access right policies. Um, so you can control um, for every representation, basically. So, right, so you have a digital title. Every title has multiple, could have uh, multiple representations. And then each representation could have multiple files. Um, so the use case for multiple representations could be a master uh, copy, which could be uh, like the high resolution. Um, open only for researchers um, or just an archive copy. And then you can have an access copy, which is low resolution PDF, for example, just a lower resolution um, JPEG. And then you can apply a different policy for each representation. So for the first one, you can open it only for um, a user group of researchers um, or faculty or so on. The second one could be open access um, or could be restricted to specific buildings. So there's a very rich set of uh, criteria which could be um, assigned to the access right policies. Um, so uh, that could be also an embargo, depending on the copyright terms or uh, an expiry date um, and, uh, and, and many others. Um, so around copyright management, we've done a lot of work in the last year or two. Um, so uh, actually a lot of requests coming from bonds and other um, institutions uh, um, um, in, uh, in Australia. Um, so, uh, first of all, we've added basically the out of the box provides all of the Creative Commons licenses and rights statement, um, and uh, and in addition to an unlimited uh, number of custom statements, um, and these statements are then displayed to the end users when um, they view uh, when they discover the uh, um, uh, the the actual content, um, and you could define whether it's obtrusive or non-obtrusive, so whether they have to sort of um, accept the terms. Um, or the statements um, before actually viewing the, uh, uh, the files, so that's optional. Um, and also we add the functionality, uh, so uh, a, a copyright statement could, uh, could be coupled with an access right policy. So if there's an alignment between the two, so that saves you managing uh, sort of the copyrights separately from the access rights. So if, if a specific policy of access right um, um, always has the same copyright statement to the end users, you could just assign it um, to the access right policy, and then that will be um, automatically displayed to all the uh, users when they access copy through that um, access right policy. Alternatively, it could be decoupled. So uh, this was actually a request that came from customers saying copyright statements aren't always aligned with the access right policy. So it's an uh, now today it's an individual entity. You can assign it in bulk via a job uh, or manually uh, to a representation, regardless of um, the access right policy. Um, so we've added support for watermarks so quite recently, um, which also relates, of course, to copyrights, but not only. Um, um, this is really the main use case that we came across. Uh, currently, the support is for images. Um, so uh, really, the flow is that you can upload um, multiple watermarks into Alma, um, and uh, which, uh, um, which signifies sort of the copyright owner, for example. Um, you can then associate or attach the watermark to a specific copyright statement. And then automatically, any digital resource which will uh, be assigned with that copyright statement will then overlay um, any images in that representation with a watermark which was uh, uh, defined as part of that copyright statement. Um, and, and also, of course, if the image will be downloaded, then it will be downloaded together with the, uh, with the watermark. Um, and um, so, so here also we're going to be expanding this also for, for other formats currently supported for images and eventually it's going to be added also for others. You can also define um, uh, whether the watermark is uh, the locate the position of it, if it's on the bottom left, uh, top left, and whether it's repeated across the file. So you have uh, um, configurations uh, around that too. Um, so controlled digital lending. Um, 
what is control digital lending? So uh, this is a, a practice which has been around for, for a long while, for, for over 10 years, actually, um, which uh, basically the, the use case is that the library has owns, uh, for example, three copies, physical copies of a book. They have three items on the shelf, um, uh, but they want to um, uh, circulate a digital copy. They want to digitize uh, one or more of the copies um, and have that on loan. Um, and um, which is not straightforward from a copyrights point of view. In fact, it still isn't straightforward, but the actual need for having a digital copy is, um, has a sort of magnified, um, especially now in the pandemic. Um, and these are some of the libraries, uh, some of the reasons why CDL is considered as, as such an important practice. Uh, first of all, of course, making it possible for libraries to fulfill the vital function in society, providing easy online access, um, so digital material also allows providing digital aids uh, for readers with printed disabilities, such as um, audio visual aids. Uh, you can zoom in onto the text, you can search for full text and stuff which you can't do um, for uh, physical copies. Then there's also the 20th century problem, um, which are older books which are unlikely to ever be offered uh, digitally um, as, for example, an electronic resource. Um, and there's other benefits which you can see here below. Um, but I think it's pretty clear why, you know, the benefits of having a digital copy in circulation. Um, um, but of course, there, um, there are the copyright uh, uh, laws in every country, um, in every state, even in, in North America, there are different uh, uh, interpretations um, of the copyright laws. And, and many of these laws were written back in the 70s, uh, sometimes even earlier when they didn't have in mind sort of the, the, uh, digital, um, um, the digital technology. Um, and therefore, the interpretation isn't straightforward. Uh, there is a controversy about it. I um, I'll just say that Ex Libris does not um, uh, take a legal stand, of course. Um, we simply know that this is a market need um, and we provide the set of tools and it's a fully configurable set of tools. So each institution can um, apply their own interpretation of the copyright laws and also copyright terms for specific resource um, um, using the set of tools that we provide. Um, so what are the uh, sort of core principles? Uh, so first of all, the, the, the focus areas that we, that we, uh, that we are uh, working on, um, and uh, one is the course resources, um, uh, materials, the other is general circulation, um, uh, that would usually be full books and so on, and the last is interlibrary loans. Um, these different categories are not only workflow categories, but also um, in a way copyright categories. So uh, this made sense for the um, uh, working groups that we are working with on CDL, uh, this made sense for them from a copyright point of view. So many institutions who are willing to go ahead with CDL for course resources are not yet prepared or their legal offices doesn't um, allow them to move on to general circulation and certainly not into library loans, which uh, introduces other complexities when it comes to uh, um, copyright laws. Um, so course resources, this has already been delivered and it's out there um, and, and I can say that it's currently being used only in North America, um, and, uh, but there are many um, um, other countries and other regions uh, who are paying a lot of interest in it. There's a lot of activity going on there um, with um, legal advisors, with legislators and so on um, to allow at least for some of the content um, to be on loan um, for via a digital copy. Um, so let's start, uh, uh, I know I just have a couple of minutes left. Um, so course resources, which is already out there, it's commonly used, uh, over 30 institutions are using this for course resources. Um, so what are the basic principles of CDL um, and specifically here for course resources? So really the idea is that the digital um, fulfillment um, has to mimic as much as possible the physical. That is really what is required in order to, um, in, so, so that the copyright laws won't be, terms won't be infringed. So uh, one uh, principle is own to loan ratio. So if you have three copies on the shelf, then no more than three users can access the digital copy um, concurrently. Um, so some institutions are stricter with that and they say that um, uh, no more than one, regardless of how many items on the shelf, no more than one user can access the digital copy. Um, since uh, a physical copy can just have one person or one patron viewing it, therefore also the digital copy should mimic that. Um, so really different interpretations and, and we just provide the set of tools, um, they can configure it accordingly. Um, of course, preventing redistribution of downloading of the files is crucial. 
um, since the moment a patron can download a copy, they can then send it through over to their friends and uh, um, colleagues and so on. It misses the whole point of CDL. So we've added um, extra measures for preventing redistribution. Um, you can't even do save as um, if in case the download is disabled. Um, we allow also exempting specific user groups from CDL. So for example, um, a, a, a patrons with print disabilities, um, they, uh, they are not limited by the uh, CDL uh, restrictions and therefore they can have free access. Again, this is optional. Um, fulfillment, so we allow, and this is more specific for course resources, we allow limiting the session period. Um, so there's an equal session period for every patron, three, four hours. Um, and which then uh, we allow having a waiting list. Um, so a patron, if currently um, the maximum number of patrons are accessing the content, then the next patron in line um, can join a, uh, a wait list and receive notifications once the resource becomes available. Um, and um, this, the, the flow was basically designed so that it will be agnostic to the source system. So it can be generated from Primo, Leganto for course resources. Actually, this flow was developed together with Harvard um, for their course resources, which are served via Leganto. Um, but it could even be generated, you know, uh, through a standalone link. Um, triggered sorry and um and then there's other sort of uh, uh, functionality which i mentioned earlier on for accessibility for patrons which is also important in the context of uh, course resources um and then the administration side we have a waitlist control on the back end which allows the uh, uh the administrators to see uh, the list of uh, patrons waiting for a specific resource um they can change the list they can um provide priority to some users inside the list push them to the top of the list or remove um, and um, this is a nice addition which just came through in, uh, in, the, in the April release. Um, it's coming through is, is the analytics. So you'll be able to uh, produce analytics on the, for example, average waiting time per resource, uh, how many patrons uh, did an early return of a resource, and that will allow you to sort of um, adjust the, the terms or, or understand if you require an additional resource and an additional copy and, and so on. So this is just a, a, a brief animated flow for uh, course resources. So for example, two users um, are accessing a content since there are two items on the shelf. Uh, a timer starts according to the configuration of, for example, two and a half hours. Uh, in the meantime, any additional user will be added to a wait list. And then once their time is up, um, then their session is ended um, and the next in line receives a notification a grace period starts according to the configuration in the system. Uh, for example, they have 20 minutes to start their session. Otherwise, if they miss the 20 minutes, it will then, uh, the resource will then move on to the next in line. Um, so um, that's really in a nutshell. Um, we have a lot of material about that, videos and so on, so you can see, uh, um, you can read further. Um, so um, just quickly about how we're working today, we're working with an advisory group uh, mainly from North America, since they are the only ones currently who are willing to impl actually implement it. But we are seeing more and more interest uh, outside of North America. Um, these are the different groups that we are working with. Um, and these are the, some of the institutions who are participating um, at, the, uh, um, at the working group. Uh, I'll just finish off by saying that the uh, roadmap plans for long-term circulation are currently being worked on. We're forming a uh, working group. So not an advisory group, but a working group of um, development partners. Um, so here it's going to be much more fully integrated into the physical flows today. Uh, there's going to be much more um, as we're going to be leveraging the fact that Alma is a unified resource management system. So in a way, CDL is classic for Alma and that uh, the system is aware of how many items on the shelf, how many are on loan at any given time. So we're going to be having automated flows uh, for providing that additional sort of um, uh, legal safety net. Um, and ILL. So uh, ILL, if anyone, uh, resource sharing, if anyone wants to hear any more details on the plans, then uh, Judith Frankel um, is the um, point of contact for that. So um, that was a lot of information in short time. Um, I will stop sharing and see if there's any questions. So Richard, I think you're muted. Ah. Yes, it wouldn't be a presentation about someone forgetting to unmute themselves. Um, thank you, Daniel. That was fantastic. Um, it was really good to hear what Exlibris is doing in that space. Now, we haven't got anything in the Q&A or in the chat. Probably. So, sorry. 
Hi, this is Margaret Warren here. I just had a question for Daniel about um, uh, around other jurisdictions that might be worthwhile um, having a conversation with um, with regard to, uh, to this. I'm, I'm, I only say this because uh, the US is one of the few jurisdictions that has a has a fair use provision in their act, which does make things a little bit easier for them, even though it's really complicated. But um, it, it would be very interesting to get some insight from a jurisdiction that doesn't have a fair use provision in their act to see if there are ways that it might be implemented, or uh, I guess ways that it can be implemented um, in the future in, in jurisdictions that don't have that. Is that something yeah. that has been talked about at all? Um, but at the, I know that the Copyright uh, Working Group has, uh, has discussed that they're actually trying to pull in um, institutions from other regions um, exactly to, to discuss that. Um, mm -hmm. I can't say that sort of, uh, that's expanded yet. Um, mm -hmm. I know that in the UK, um, there are very active discussions there. Um, and by the way, in, in, uh, also in North America, there's, there's currently, um, uh, there is actually a, um, a court case going on there against the Internet Archive, which was supposed to be uh, completed back in November, but it's actually dragged out. It's still uh, dragged out, and there are many institutions are waiting to see the outcome. Um, so it's, it's also in North America, different institutions are, are, are you know, um, concerned at different levels. Um, so it, it's not sort of, we can't look at North America as a as sort of a whole entity in the way they interpret it. So um, mm -hmm. um, also the status there isn't, isn't clear uh, completely. Um, and a lot of the work that they're doing there is they, they've united together the institutions, they're working with the legislators. So this isn't, uh, 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 this isn't necessarily based on the original copyright terms, uh, explicit uh, uh, wording, which allows them to do it, but more of work that they're currently doing, active work that they're doing with the legislators, even uh, senators, um, um, to allow this to happen. So it's, it's interesting because we have um, a piece of legislation here at the moment um, that may or may not get through before the before uh, the the next election, which specifically addresses um, some needs to make things easier for. Uh, for libraries and archives in particular, around quotation, around making theses available online, all sorts of things that would be quite helpful in this environment when they go through, and also changes to the statutory regulations for educational institutions. So it's a fairly movable feast, but there's also a lot of pushback um, in the UK and also in the US trying to make it harder. And I think one of our roles as libraries and people are advocating for the users, and this is not your, your role, but your role, I guess, is to listen to us in that advocacy for broader access to information and ideas to, you know, feed the digital economy and, um, and, and to both respect creators' rights, but to respect the rights of users as well. So I think it's really great to bring in those systems that could then provide um, some uh, measure of security for publishers and rights owners, but to also make sure that we're continuing to advocate for broader access. Right. So that's just my soapbox. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thank you, Margaret. That was a good question. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, we are a little bit over time. So unless anyone's got any burning questions, we might wrap it up now. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending. As we said, this session will be recorded. Uh, so the recording will be up on our YouTube channel in a few days and it will be available freely online so you can share it. Thank you everyone for attending. And so it really appreciates everything. Uh, Peter, were there any last words you'd like to say before we head off? Uh, just the final message from me is that um, as you leave this event, you should have had a link to our post-event survey. So please take a minute or two to fill that in. Um, but I, some people may have left already. So I'll send that out to the, um, the mailing list as well. That's it. Thank you and to all. Thanks all of our presenters. Yes, thank you. You're absolutely fantastic, all of you. Okay, thank you.